Welcome to Thursday and webinar time from a, well, dark and stormy uh, Brisbane. I, I reckon we could have a massive thunderstorm arrive in the middle of this at my place because it's very dark outside. Me too. And given we are virtually suburb by suburb, um, we may yet cut out everybody. So fingers crossed that we remain. <laughs> welcome welcome to summer storm season. Anyway, I'm Chris Irons from Stratosolve. With me, as always, Frank Higginson, partner Heinz League and Legal. Frank, welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello, Chris. And the good thing about this is that everyone will know what date uh, this webinar was held because Frank's wearing a remembrance poppy today. Very classy, Frank. <laughs> I forgot, <laughs> which probably makes me un-Australian. Oh, well, um, so be it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're talking about money and variations thereof when it comes to body corporate, always a topic of some interest. Um, reminder, as always, uh, don't forget to register for these events. That's how you find out what's going on. Please uh, feel free to ask some questions during live chat today, but if your question, as always, is a little bit more involved uh, and perhaps a little bit off topic even, you're much better off using the form in the link that we have just posted and we'll show up there any second now. There it is. Um, this week, take it to the bank. Cash money, cash money. Cash money, cash money. Money talks, all of that sort of stuff. But today, three things in particular, Frank. Strata bank accounts, loans and investment yeah yep 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 i suppose um you know like for me one of the things that gets tossed around all the time at strata managers is fraud you guys on the take all that sort of stuff it is just you don't see it happen um there's there's one or two instances that we have seen happen and that's more a rogue employee than anything else and i mean um we've had one of those in our own business took us for 30 grand out of our general account before we knew what was going on so um it happens despite checks and balances but that's not what we're talking about today it's sort of i suppose you'd almost call it the financial fundamentals like in, you know back to chris your analogy a body corporate is a business um a really important part of every business is understanding what's going on financially with it mm. um and that i suppose invests in the committee really doesn't it absolutely it does and there are some pretty strict rules about how the body corporate allocates its money and we actually i i think we're using the word allocate quite deliberately today frank mm. rather than spend or use um so the body corporate brings in money it has to in order to survive and then it has to take that money and allocate it out to certain things. Uh, so in other words, uh, the body corporate has funds for purpose, um, if you want to think of yeah. it in those terms. Yeah, which is one, one of our favourite adages, Frank. Uh, body corporate should never be in the red. Um, should always be uh, at equilibrium, shouldn't it? Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. And I suppose it's one of those things, when you say allocate, it's not spend in the context of, you know, we earn a wage, you decide, at the end of the week or the month or whatever it is, I'm going to go to the pub tonight, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That's not what bodies corporates do. So they're creatures of statute. So they've got certain, you know, and I suppose the legislation's pretty clear about what goes into a sinking fund, everything else goes into the admin fund and what those funds mm -hmm. can actually be used for. So it's not really, you know, and I suppose this example, the body corporate's got a statutory obligation to insure. Okay. So a portion of that money that's raised needs to go towards insurance and that's what the budget's all about. So there's not, you know, a body corporate doesn't take its neighbouring owner to dinner once a fortnight, doesn't buy roses mm. for its, all of its owners and all those sort of things. So that's the allocation bit. But even though there's no discretion to it, I suppose, in terms of what it spends money on, there's still that element of it, it, it must still deal with what it's raised for proper purposes. And I suppose in that context, Frank, it seems a little odd to be talking about investment because investment suggests that you've got some money lying around and you want to put it to good use. But a body corporate technically shouldn't have a slush fund or contingency, should it? No, contingency, well and truly, that's been adjudicated. So no, um, there's, there's some art, art in uh, putting together a budget. So rather mm -hmm. than have a line item as a contingency, which you cannot do, you might be able to frame it in other ways. Um, and I suppose then... Um, you know, body corporate funds are a bit like, you know, our trust account. So we've got a trust account we have in that trust account. Who knows how many clients have deposits, funds on account, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that could be millions of dollars at any given point in time. So what we've got going on, we don't have separate accounts for them all. 
but what mm. we have is separate ledgers. And I suppose bodies mm. corporates can operate the same way, where there's one fund, one account where all the money is, but it's allocated in a sense towards different projects or different parts of it. Um, and there may well be, in a sinking fund particular, you might have invested um, the 400 grand that you've got set aside that you're not going to need to spend in the next two years. And I suppose part of what we're talking about today is, what do you mean by investment? Indeed. And one of, one of the comments I put on social media today, Frank, was can a body corporate invest in crypto? Um, we'll get to that towards the end of today. Um, but first, uh, you've been talking about accounts, Frank. So let's talk about bank accounts and, and strata funds uh, to kick things off. So unless you're in a specified two lot scheme, uh, all bodies corporate are uh, must open a bank account with a financial institution, which could be a bank, can be a building society, credit union. Uh, and since 2003, that must be done with the consent of the body corporate. Okay, well, that's that's pretty basic, isn't it? So It is, but it's not a trust account in the way that ours are. Mm. So, and this is, I suppose, back to that most confusing question on every year's AGM papers about are we auditing or are we not auditing? Mm. So, um, like we get, I think, three three audits or four audits a year on our trust account. Body yeah. corporate accounts aren't that, but they still must have one. Yep, that's right. Which leads, of course, to the eternal question, who operates the body corporate bank account? Uh, so, it's either uh, anybody who's authorised by the body corporate to do that, and that means two members of the committee, uh, or it means the body corporate manager, if there's one appointed and they're authorised to do it, or an associate of the body corporate manager, uh, which means an employee, I guess, Frank, of that body yes. corporate management yeah. firm. So that's what the legislation says. I think the practice, it's fair to say, Frank, is that if you've got a body corporate manager engaged to manage your scheme, then they've got not so much control, but they have access to an operation of the body corporate funds through that account. They do. And I suppose then it's a question for each committee about how they authorise the expenditure from that. So I suppose from my end, um, you know, and most body corporate managers as part of their administrative role are quite happy to assume responsibility for that because that's where the levy, the levies go, sorry, not the levies, the invoices go to them, they should be loading them up for payment, all that sort of stuff. Like for me, there's a difference between authorising payment and um, approving payment. So, so when an invoice comes in from Heinz Legal or Stratasol for a job, um, you know, to me, the committee, absent sort of having some other arrangement with the body corporate manager, should be authorising that to be paid. And then the body corporate manager should be pursuant to that authorisation or approving that to be paid, pursuant mm -hmm. to that authorisation, ticking the box for checks to go out and all that sort of thing. So that, but I suppose it's open to committees if they wanted to have that sort of control to do it for themselves, as much as the banks probably aren't dealt with it. And you, it would... Um, I think probably the best thing about having a body corporate manager in control is you've got one point of contact. Yeah, it's like it's like us, mate. When we take instructions from a committee, it's much easier having one person tell us what to do rather than have six people engaging with us with various ideas and all that sort of stuff. And it's the same with financial management. If you've got three people that are potentially authorising payments, what is going to happen is people are going to get paid twice and potentially some none at all because I think someone else has done it. It happens. Uh, so, Frank, in, in with my other hat on, I am on a not-for-profit board, uh, unconnected with Strata, and exactly that situation happened. Um, at least two of us have to authorise payments, and so you have a situation where uh, somebody prepares the payment, uh, and then it comes to the members of the management committee on which I sit to authorise the payment. But, of course, if one of us is working or busy or away or doesn't see the email come through to approve the payment, it's going to sit there. And if that payment's super urgent, that's really problematic. So that's exactly your point in a nutshell, yeah. I think, Frank. If you, why wouldn't you, if you've got a body corporate manager, why wouldn't you have them uh, have that responsibility to manage, manage the account? Yeah. Um, and that leads, I suppose what happens, Frank, is then you have this really common misconception, don't you, that the body corporate manager controls the money. It, they, it's their money. How many times have we heard from managers or at seminars or at webinars, the body corporate manager's got my money? Yeah. It's just not the case, is no, it? No, they don't. No, they don't. Um, they don't. The committee's, the committee's in control of that. And I suppose that's part of the understanding the roles and responsibilities, particularly at committee level, because it's it's that approval bit that's the really important bit in my experience. And then it's also scrutinising at the end of the year, you'd almost look at your budget 
budget expenditure versus actual expenditure and made sure that's actually happened. You know, that's, that's yeah, that, that I think probably I'd say, and it's not a matter of not trusting people you've got um, to do jobs. It's a matter of understanding, like if you're on a committee, you've got to treat it as you would be a board of directors in terms of actually having some financial understanding about what's going on. Right. And, and you might you might put one person, the treasurer in charge of that, who can then sort of report back. And I know um, you, you get, um, I'm, I'm smiling because I know there's a client watching this that is one of those that watches every single cent in and out of the body corporate bank accounts, including us, which is fine, um, but they love doing it. So if that person's on your committee, go your hardest. Uh, absolutely. If, you, if you've got an accountant or a retired accountant or an auditor on your committee, well, that can actually be a great thing. Um, but it's about, as you say, Frank, knowing who is responsible for what. And if you've got too many cooks, the broth is going to get spoilt. Mm. It's always the case. Um, having said all of that, in terms of the interaction with the bank, um, the bank will typically want to see a copy of the minutes where the two uh, committee members have been authorised. Um, so that's an essential part of the process. And if there is actually the case that the body corporate want to remove the body corporate manager as a signatory, they can do that. Uh, so that is, Frank, which form? Form two. Very good. Form two, uh, yes, and probably 100 points of ID for the committee members. And probably the minute too, I suspect. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just putting up a link there to the form two. So. Once that Form 2 has been properly authorised and handed to the bank, uh, the bank can't let the body corporate manager access the account any further at that point. Well, they shouldn't anyway. Um, yeah, they shouldn't. Uh, and this is probably, you know, one of my anecdotes, Frank, when I was commissioner, uh, our, the office would from time to time get calls from either bank employees or committee members who were there at the branch attempting to either open or close or change signatories to account and getting all sorts of grief about, I don't know what this is, I don't know what's going on here, that kind of thing. That Those are exceptions, I think, Frank, uh, these days. I think it's far better understood now how that process works. Um, but it still can happen. There's still, there might you might get a situation where the bank staff just aren't really sort of following the logic of a body corporate or vice versa, for that matter, you've got committees who are just not following the process. Hmm. That's where problems can arise. And I suppose, you know, there's a couple of banks that obviously specialise in mm -hmm. this that have, you wouldn't call them relationships, you'd arrangements with strata management companies where it's a seamless opening management exercise and all that sort of stuff. And I suppose Macquarie is probably the biggest one of those where they just make it so easy. And I know even from our perspective, when we're putting funds on deposit, they make it easy. Not, not pitching them. I'm not on a retainer or anything yeah. like that. But but if you're doing it on your own, that's the sort of stuff that, that can happen. Yep, totally. Um, and look, this, Frank, I think you touched upon this point just a little earlier in some of your opening remarks. Um, the body corporate can have as many bank accounts as it decides, chooses. But at the end of the day, uh, remember, we're talking about accounts as opposed to funds. So the account, if you like, is the, the product, but there's two funds, a sinking fund and an administrative fund. Uh, and those things, one of the big ones, Frank, can't be intermingled. No, can't. you can't. And so there might, this might be a part accounting exercise, might be a part physical separation exercise, but the act is express in terms of funds cannot be transferred amongst accounts. So we have that from time to time. So if for some reason a body corporate's collected a some sort of windfall gain that goes into the sinking fund, what can't happen is those monies are put into the admin fund from a ledger perspective to reduce people's levies. Yeah. All you can do is go and look at what the sinking fund forecast is and trim that accordingly. So suddenly you don't need to raise as much over the next 10 years as you did because of this windfall amount. So your levies can come down. Yep. Yep, that's the way it gets done. Quite right, Frank. Well, let's go from accounts to borrowing then in that case. So the fundamental concept there is body corporate can in, indeed borrow, uh, just like pretty much anybody else can, um, mm -hmm. subject to the usual criteria. But then there's additional criteria which apply to the body corporate in terms of approving it. Uh, and at the moment, Frank, we've got some emergency COVID legislation. One wonders for how much longer it's an emergency. But anyway. <laughs> as opposed uh, to normal. <laughs> as opposed to normal, yes, that's right. But in any event, um, we've talked about this before, but there are COVID-related body corporate laws in place up until 30 April next year at this point. Yep. 
Yep. I've got it right. Yeah. Uh, and under that, uh, by ordinary resolution, the body corporate can borrow up to an amount equal to 500 bucks multiplied by the number of lots in the scheme. And the difference there is if it happens, uh, there's some differences if it's the small schemes module. So they're the COVID specific ones, but otherwise, Frank, it's actually a bit different, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So it's sort of, um, so you might ask, why would a body corporate need to borrow? Um, and really, I suppose to me, there's a, the special levy versus borrowing thing here. So again, we've got a, we've got a body corporate that's trying to be long just fine, everything's okay, um, and it gets something from left field. So the same as we had our windfall gain a minute ago, now we've got a windfall pain in the backside because right. a retaining wall's fallen over, the lifts have broken four years ahead of schedule. Uh, one client we've helped recently um, had to replace the roof on their building, um, which was out of left field. Wasn't, wasn't mismanagement, wasn't people not doing what they should be doing in terms of maintenance, but it appeared. So interesting enough, and here's, I suppose, um, what you call it, that used to be, Chris, your little tidbits as commissioner. Um, Ooh. Oh, come on. No, what we, when we first sat down, here's a little... Our commissioner reveal. Commissioner reveal, yes. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's a lawyer reveal in a sense of a body corporate can't ever be insolvent. So um, unlike companies, when, when a company can't pay its debts as and when they fall due, it's up to the shareholders to decide whether they continue to contribute towards the cost required to run the company or whether they tip it into some form of administration, insolvency, receivership, liquidation, whatever it is. That can't happen at body corporate level. So a body corporate actually has a statutory responsibility to raise funds for mm. issues that aren't otherwise foreseen. So back to that spending thing, it's got to, it's got to create the money that it needs to then allocate. So it can do that by a special levy, yep. which are the nasty words, and it can do that by borrowing. So the before COVID, there was this disincentive to borrow because the approval level to borrow was higher than the equivalent approval level to raise a special levy. Let's let's uh, quickly dip into that, Frank, because that's a good mm. moment, and then back back to what you're saying, because I think that's mm. equally important. So, uh, we talked about the COVID stuff, but if the COVID stuff was not applicable at, or after April 2022, under the standard module, it'll be the number of lots multiplied by 250 bucks, and that's ordinary resolution. Any more than that, resolution without dissent. And remember, resolution without dissent is not unanimous, just that no one can say no mm. under the accommodation commercial modules it's the same uh except that it is a special resolution not an ordinary resolution and then on the small schemes module it's an ordinary resolution for total borrowing of up to three thousand and then over three thousand resolution without dissent sorry frank back to you oh you're right <laughs> so there's this difference so obviously politically they want people to raise money and chip it in and mm. probably in the last I'd say 12, 18 months, we've seen more clients borrowing yep. than as body corporate clients than I've seen forever before. And you can do a blend. You can do a bit yep. of each, yep. you know? So um, it's really up to the committee of the time to decide, well, we've got 100,000 or 200,000 or a million dollar problem. How are we going to do it? And then it's a matter of you know, what our owners have got because not many people have a lazy 10 or 15 grand lying around they can put their hands on. Maybe I suppose in this booming property market, everyone's got equity, mate, as Commonwealth Bank would say, but they still might not want to spend it. So, um, and then borrowing is effectively from a, for, for a bank perspective, relatively rare. But if, if I go to borrow money, it's going to get more than likely security over something I own, house, which is what a mortgage is for, and yep. a personal guarantee from me to say that if I can't, they don't get it from the house, if they have to sell me up, they're going to get it from me. Body corporate's not like that. It, it's it's the body corporate borrows and the bank in theory is unsecured as much as everyone's responsible for their proportionate share of that debt over a period of time. So um, that's where the choice is. So you, you still need to have the resolution. And I think for mm. me, one of the things that um, like a special levy, they're dealt, they're dealt with differently too from a contractual perspective in a sale side of things. So the standard REIQ contract for a special levy says that levy struck before the contract date are a seller responsibility. Levy struck after the contract date are a buyer responsibility. So that's sort of similar to buyer beware, caveat emptor. The mm -hmm. moment you sign a contract to purchase, you're on risk, so you should have insurance unless the contract says otherwise. So that's how special levies get dealt with from a sale perspective. But borrowing is different because borrowing is going to survive well and truly, usually, the sale process. Yep. So for mine, what's, what's required when a body corporate is borrowed is the seller of the property is required to disclose that borrowing to the buyer. And there's a specific section in the contract for that to happen.
So yep. that's under section 223. And then, of course, the issue becomes about the communication of the difference between special levy and borrowing and about mm -hmm. if there are pros and cons, if the committee has a preference, and in this case, the preference would appear to be borrowing, up to the committee to communicate the narrative about it. Yeah. We, we prefer borrowing and here are all the reasons why. And there might be financial reasons. There might be any other kind of reasons. But it's important to communicate that early and constructively because remember, once 30 April next year comes around, uh, we'll be back to resolution without dissent. And that's a very high threshold to achieve. Yeah. So you've got to actually put in the yeah. effort to achieve yeah, it. Yeah, you'd be saying if you want to get it done, under a more relaxed regime, now's the time to do it. And the issue, I suppose, then for owners is you you might be forced to do something that you don't want to do, be it contribute to a special levy because you want to borrow or vice versa. And sure. that's the nature of community living. This is the sort of consensus, you sort of consensus decision making, yeah. but it's going to involve some people being forced to do something they don't want to do. And that's one of the, the prices of of owning a strata building. You, you get to share the pain with everyone financially, but you might have to do something you don't necessarily want to do. And there's no way around that. If that's what happens, that's what happens. That is it, absolutely. Um, we've just put a link up there to that legislative provision about those COVID specific uh, laws about borrowing. Um, got a couple of questions there. We will get to those before the end today. So please sit tight, but let's talk about investment, Frank. Um, so- Bitcoin, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> the administrative and sinking funds may be invested in the way a trustee may invest funds. So that's from the standard module, section 167.4, if you're playing along at home. All right, so what does that mean? Well, well yeah, you, you, yeah, you've almost, um, like trustees have a fiduciary obligation to act in the interest of their beneficiaries. So <laughs> when they're making decisions about um, the investment of trust funds, um, I suppose, I suppose well, it's interesting. This really, I don't think, from a body corporate perspective, has been, you'd say, litigated, adjudicated in terms of where things go. Because investment, in a sense, to me, um, and, and don't get me wrong, the safest place to go where everyone puts um, money is in seeking fund term deposits, which at the moment are yeah. running along at a whole rock star 0 0.0 whatever yeah. percent. Um, I have seen clients invest in a mortgage fund as a body corporate and lose money. Um, I haven't seen clients invest in um, properties as much as in theory you could. I haven't seen clients go and buy shares direct on the share market as much as you probably could because a trustee can absolutely do that. So I think there's the wide ranging discretion that trustees have to invest and the overlay that yeah. we've got with Strata is that committee and body corporate obligation to act reasonably. So would it be reasonably, Chris, would it be reasonably? Would it be reasonable for a body corporate to go and buy 15 Bitcoin with their sinking fund and cross their fingers? Well, technically, uh, I guess I'd start from the position, Frank, where technically they could, technically, at the outset. Would that be a reasonable thing to do? Uh, and that's where the argument, I think, gets really interesting because what happens if Bitcoin's gone absolutely through the roof at that particular point in time and it gets the body corporate an extraordinary return, which they can then use for various things around the scheme? That's pretty reasonable, isn't it? Unless it goes the other way. Uh, yes, or unless Elon Musk has a thought bubble on Twitter and then... <laughs> Or so it's a billion dollar worth of Tesla. That's, yep. that's it. That's it. Is is the volatility of that particular investment source an unreasonable way of investing funds? I'd actually lean towards saying it is, Frank. That that would be my view. What do you think? Yeah, I think it, it as always, it's a question of degree. This stuff, and it's interesting. I've got um, I'm on a board that's uh, you know a bit of a uh, well not for profit foundation probably got half a million dollars and we've got a couple of um, very well healed, not healed, experienced individuals putting together a plan. And one of them, um, who's literally written economics textbooks, said to me, Frank, the first rule you need to know is you, you can't lose money. And the second rule is see rule one. So, so in that sense, because I, I, I joke with him too, we're going to go buy some crypto. <laughs> and, and no, it's a nice, safe fund where, I mean, in theory, our constitution allows us to do whatever we want, but from a probity perspective and an accountability perspective, I'm not going to expose the people that have contributed to it um, to that sort of risk. And, and, you know, that, in, 
And the counter, Frank, is actually the question to be asking. If somebody wants to argue back, well, I think we should invest in crypto because it's a wave of the future and this is how we protect our money. My question back to any committee member who said that to me is how are you going to manage the risk there? What are you going to do about the risk of investing in something which is, for all intents and purposes, unregulated? How you yeah, mate, I suppose you go the next, and again, this is very unscripted, ladies and gentlemen, because mm. I've, I've, I've come into this um, about five minutes before I started with after being out all morning. Um, when you look at, you know, we're talking about the body corporate having an obligation to refill its coffers yep. when, it, when it has a liability for which it doesn't have the cover. Let's, you know, you talk about mark to market in terms of share market investments, because that, well, that's where they get valued based on what they're worth as opposed to what they realise. So the share market's up, the share market's down, and away you go. So, you know, we need 400 grand in our sinking fund. We've gone and tipped it all into Bitcoin. Suddenly, Bitcoin halves overnight, and we've got 200 worth of value in our sinking fund. Mm. Are we obliged to go and clip, clean that up to add the other 200 then straight away? Because, sure, as I'm sitting here now, if we go to realise that investment, we've done 200 and we're short. Yep. So as I sit here and think about that, it just um, that sort of volatility would be exceedingly dangerous for a body corporate to invest in. And again, I'm no financial advisor, but in terms of you complying with your strata obligations, mm. that would be horrific. That That's where I kind of get to as well, Frank. Um, and while we're on the topic of investments, um, there's no capacity for a body corporate to refund levies so that's that's a, a i guess a, a, poor, a component of that discussion about investments as well we want to get to our best practice section as we always do at the end but let's try and address a few of these questions julia as always thanks for tuning in can the treasurer go to the bank and request copies of the bank statements by showing the agm minutes uh because seemingly you're not getting any uh for several months i guess you could julia and i'd say no only on the basis that the bank's not going to hand over information to someone by virtue of them rolling up with the AGM minutes. So what the bank's going to have is authorised signatories on the account, and they're the people mm. that they will be giving statements to. So, I suppose I'd, I'd, I'd say it depends on which branch you go to. Yeah. <laughs> how nice you are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That can happen. Yeah. 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 How, how, many, how many times do we see a film in which uh, the robbers sweet talk the bank staff? Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, I watched one just last week. Anyway, getting way off track there. But, Julia... Um, your question goes to a far more fundamental problem about lack of access to records and lack of information, it would appear. But yeah, we think probably not. Uh, Glenno, as always, thanks for tuning in. Can the body corporate make a donation to charity? Do you want to take this one, Frank? Yeah, I, um, to be honest, we're in the middle of a, uh, an adjudication about this very issue at the moment. So I should temper my words. Um, and when that arrives, we will um, let people know. That's a normal yes and no, but it's not appropriate no, for no, 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 life in those circumstances. I think that's totally fair. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly answer. got a view. Yeah, yeah. Go I'll answer, and I think the answer is no, Glenno, but we'll see. Um, and then Glenno again, can an owner privately pay for a common property improvement? Depends what's going on, I think, Glenno, in that particular case. Um, if they're the ones wanting to make the improvement for their benefit, well, yeah. Um, with the approval of the committee. There's a process to go through in that. I think if you hop on our web website, I was about to say web page, um, I've definitely written an article on, uh, I think, um, body corporate spending, which I think I covered that because that's yep. owners improving common property and the committee yep. approval process. I think it's three grand and it can't interfere yep. unreasonably with other people's amenity and all that sort of stuff. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Dorian, thanks for tuning in. What are your thoughts on the manager opening a bank account before the date of their appointment and the manager opened an account early by putting a resolution to open early in the appointment resolution? I would say no. No. Can't see well, how they that. Been, if they haven't been authorised, they haven't been authorised would be my take. So if they're, they're not engaged... Oh, well, I suppose it's not so much the manager opening the account. Is is If a body corporate authorised me as their lawyer to go and open a bank account appropriately, then I could do it. So it's not necessarily contingent on the engagement, I would say, because you don't... I think a body corporate manager probably could open a bank account on behalf of a potential client, the same as I could, but there'd be obviously bank issues and all that sort of stuff with it. I'm, I'm seeing a scenario, possibly, Dorian, where you're thinking about a, a situation where... Maybe the scheme hasn't had a manager before or currently doesn't have a manager uh, and the, the AGM is coming up and for whatever reason, they might be the only proposed manager. And I suppose uh, sometimes when a strata manager might mm -hmm. say to a body corporate, go away, take your books and records and they're in limbo in the meantime until the new manager's appointed, 
that happens. So they're, yes, they're, they're yeah, temporary. okay. So possibly yes, uh, maybe if they're an administrator as well, Frank, or doing a part five yep. that. Yep. Well, except yep. they'd have to be appointed to do that. Um, it's a good question, though, Dorian. Um, very quickly, best practice. Um, what's our best practice? Well, look, everything uh, to do with financial transactions are tightly regulated and tightly controlled, and then everything to do with the body corporate is tightly regulated and tightly controlled. So put the two together, and you've got lots of obligations. And I say so, everything to do with other people's money is even more tightly controlled, and that's where people are very friend. emotionally yes. invested in uh, things that aren't being done right. So just be yep. uh, super careful. Yep. Really, yeah. Because uh, and the one thing I would say is that you follow process. The reason why this process is to cover your ass, basically. Mm. The moment you deviate from process is the moment things go wrong. Always. Always. A um, couple of quick questions uh, are there at the end. Gleno, how do we get in touch with Stratasolve? That's a fantastic question, Gleno. Chris, Chris, um, Chris at stratasolve.com.au. Indeed. Thank put you, Frank. I'd put that in the comments, Chris, just to reply. Uh, uh, yep. And then, Dorian, uh, a follow-up comment there. Usually managers are trying to get set up before taking over. Uh, I get that, except that they're not taking over until they're authorised, technically. So, as much as it may be a fait accompli. Um, yeah. But is it ever a fair complete? That's the no. thing. Um, that's the thing. Uh, we have well and truly reached the end. Um, thanks, everyone. Next, next week, Chris, what are we doing? Next week, we decide <laughs> we're going to do a pretty benign vanilla topic. <laughs> no, no controversy at all in this no. one. No, next week we're going there, Frank. Uh, vaccinations in Strata. We're going there. Um, it's a big topic. You would have seen the Career Mail article in which one of us got quoted yesterday. Yeah, yeah, well yeah, done, yeah. Frank. Um, I'm yep. signing copies for people at 20 bucks a throw. But there's been a couple of big developments over the last week in relation to uh, COVID and particularly in relation to Strata. The home quarantining uh, provisions have thrown a bit of an interesting spanner in those works. Uh, we're going to delve into that uh, along with the general vaccination and Strata issues. Come prepared with your opinions, are preferably informed. Um, crazy positive, conspiracy. Positive, constructive yeah. ones, please. Right. Crazy Trolls. conspiracy theories probably won't be accepted. Um, uh, depends, depends, depends how um, provocative we're feeling, I suppose. Oh, well, according to someone I played golf with once, I should be dead now because I'm vaccinated. 70% mm -hmm. of the people who got the vaccine were going to die. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. when that's going to happen. But anyway. <laughs> Um, geez, uh, hopefully Frank will be here next week. Everyone, me too, for that matter. Hopefully, we'll both be here next week. Um, but for now, Frank, thank you. Thank you, mate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. For a dry topic, but yeah. detailed one. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Done. Bye. Bye.